Here you go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to attend this talk. It's uh, benefits of uh, Node Local DNS Cache. Uh, I know it's the last session uh, for the day, so we'll try to keep it short and fun and uh, make sure you're all ready for the evening party. Awesome. Uh, like like uh, it was just introduced, I'm Pavitra Ramesh. I've been working on Kubernetes for over a year now, um, mostly in the DNS space of late. Uh, and uh, before we jump into the content, I'd like to get a sense of uh, how many of you here have already used Node Local DNS Cache? Awesome. OK, thank you. Thank you for trying it out. Uh, and uh, how many of you have had to debug DNS latency in your clusters? OK, I expected it to be a super set, but wow, OK, that was more than I expected. Uh, cool. Not cool that you had to debug, but good to know that it's a common problem. Uh, and finally, how many of you are wondering if you're in the wrong talk? I'm just kidding. Awesome. Thank you for not raising your hand, so everybody here wants to be in this talk. That's Great. So on that note, let's jump in. Uh, the agenda for today is uh, the following. We're going to start by giving a short intro to what Node Local DNS Cache is and why we need it to answer the why. We're going to uh, quickly look at what the current DNS setup is in Kubernetes and how Node Local fits in. Uh, then we'll talk about what new metrics are available to you when you enable this feature. Uh, then we have a very interesting section that uh, Blake will be covering, uh, which uh, goes over what, what real life improvements in an actual production cluster are after enabling the feature. Uh, then we talk about, OK, how can I deploy this in my cluster? OK, oh, in any of your clusters, that is. And then uh, future work, what's coming? And finally, we'll, we'll have time for questions. Uh, as you can see, it's a packed agenda, but we will keep it brief and uh, hopefully fun. OK, let's jump in. What is Node Local DNS Cache? It is an add-on that runs a DNS caching agent on every node. So there's one instance running on every node as a daemon set. And all pods that run on a specific node talk to their local instance for all their DNS needs. So that's the short definition of what that feature is. And why do we need this? For this, I added a screenshot of some of the GitHub issues. Tag yourself if you participated in one of these. Uh, these are issues uh, asking for a feature similar to this, or it's discussing DNS latency, and the conversation converges to a solution like what we built. These are just some of them. Uh, there'll be more, and many of them closed now since we got this feature out. But why are uh, DNS uh, latency issues showing up in Kubernetes clusters? These are just some of the reasons I put out there. Not all clusters are the same. So if you've experienced it, it could be one of these. It could be a different reason. It could be a mix of some of these. And even these reasons are not independent. They are intertwined. So the first one I'd like to talk about is too many queries all at once. So too many parallel queries. And by v4 and v6, I actually mean a and quad A records. So why does this happen? Uh, think about if a cluster or a client pod is trying to look up foo.com. The client is trying to issue only one request, maybe two requests, uh, A record and a quad A record. But this is actually translated into several more requests. And you can see all the search path suffixes that get added in that red box there. So all these suffixes are added to make it five queries of uh, type A, and five queries of quad A records. So you can get 10 or even more queries for every actual query that a pod requests. And uh, this can increase the chance of a net filter race condition. And I link this here. Uh, there's a very nice blog post that explains why this happens when there's a network address translation. So you can take a look. I will say it is pretty hard to pinpoint that this is what you're running into if there is a packet drop. Uh, the metrics to track if this is happening aren't super clear, but it might be one of the reasons. But parallel queries are problematic even otherwise. Here are some of the other reasons. Too many DNS queries overwhelming connection tracking tables. And parallel queries can make that problem worse too. For every connection uh, that, that happens on your node, whether it's address translated or not, 
there is a tracking going on. So each of these connections occupy an entry in your connection tracking table, which has a limit. So if you have more connections opening up than there is space in the table, those are going to get dropped. And packet drops are not great, not good at all, especially for UDP. What are the other reasons? Uh, again, more parallel queries means DNS mask concurrent connections limit. This is less of an issue now that core DNS has become the uh, default. But if you're running kubeDNS, you might still run into this. The default is 150 connections uh, concurrently to a single DNS mask instance. There could be cloud provider limits that allow you to do only a certain number of queries from a node. And if you're doing more than those, those might be dropped as well, causing the same latency problem. And finally, this is actually a reason rather than a separate point. Since UDP is a, an unreliable protocol, if packets are dropped somewhere, the client doesn't know whether the packet is really dropped or coming back really slow. So it's going to give the benefit of doubt and wait the entire time out. So that's, by default, five seconds. So these are some of the reasons that we might be seeing latency, DNS latency in Kubernetes clusters. Now, even without node local cache, there are a bunch of solutions or workarounds that, you can, that can help in, this case, in these cases. And let's look at those. The first one is using an option called single request reopen. What this option does is it tells the resolver to issue sequential queries rather than all at once. And by doing this, you're reducing the number of parallel queries. Do note that not all DNS resolver libraries support this option. The muscle implementation that Alpine uses doesn't support this uh, specifically. Uh, but that this is one way to reduce the parallelism in the queries. Then there are other options that reduce the number of queries itself, reducing your n dots. n dots is another DNS option that you can set to a lower value. This basically disables the search path expansion that we talked about earlier. So it says, if I have a certain number of dots in my query already, don't even bother trying to expand it into 10 queries. Just give me what I asked for. Just look, look up what I asked for. Running kubeDNS, DNS mask as daemon sets to spread the load. That's another solution you can try. Uh, again, these are some more workarounds uh, at the time. And modifying DNS mask parameters to increase the number of connection limit. Uh, then uh, using a more reliable protocol, using TCP for your DNS connections with the use VC option. Again, I haven't had too much luck with this being consistent. So uh, again, it might work depending on what client images you use. And another one I want to point out, it's relatively new, uh, an AutoPath plugin in Core DNS. This basically still gives you the search path expansion feature, but it moves that logic to the server. So the client still requests only a small, only a single or two queries, but all the search expansion happens in the server, so you reduce the parallelism again. So these are some of the workarounds. So let's see how node local DNS fits in here. And here I have a diagram of how the workflow would look like and where the cache fits in. Like I mentioned, you have the gray box, which is a node. And uh, we have a caching agent that runs one per node. So you have it in the blue uh, box here. That's the local DNS cache. Uh, it gets its own interface uh, and an it's exclusive IP address, a linked local IP that it listens on. And uh, requests coming to that IP will be handled by the local cache. Uh, when you enable this add-on, you also uh, the kubelet flag to change the cluster DNS is automatically done for you. So that's the flag that tells kubelet to write the name server in the pods. So it will now write this link local IP in the pods resolve.conf. So pods will talk to the node local cache rather than kubeDNS service. Uh, now let's see what happens when uh, the client tries to look up some, some host name. Uh, if you look at the lines in green, uh, it can send a request via TCP or UDP. UDP is by default. It hits the local cache, and if there is a cache hit, the response goes back to the client pod directly. And I want to point out that connections between the local cache and the client pods are not tracked, meaning they do not occupy entries in the connection tracking table. Uh, so you bypass the net filter layer for these connections. So if you have a cache hit, you don't have to touch the network address translation code at all, code path at all. However, if there is a cache miss, which is the arrow in the bottom, you will go to node local cache still, 
but no local cache will talk to the kubedns service ip uh, to get the authoritative answer back and this does require address translation but it uses tcp rather than udp which is the more reliable protocol and uh, we also reuse connections so you're not going to create one connection entry for every request that the pod made that wasn't in the cache so this is how node local fits in let's see how this improves the problems we listed earlier so now uh, the too many queries problem is fixed too many parallel queries problem is uh, fixed because you're not doing connection tracking. So they, the, those queries are not filling up the tracking table. They are also being cached, so they're not going out to kubedns all the time. There is no net filter addr address translation code, so the, anything could potentially cause the race is out of the picture. DNS mask, concurrent connections limit, same thing. It's reduced number of queries. External queries go directly to the node resolver. They don't even have to go to cluster DNS. And piggybacking on that same point, since external queries go directly to the node resolver from that node, you're able to better utilize any node-specific limits there might be for DNS queries. And finally, we talked about uh, UDP. So we are upgrading the connections to TCP. So that's taken care of as well. These are some of the performance benefits you get by enabling node local DNS cache. But that's not all. You get extra visibility and metrics as well. Node local DNS uses core DNS as a cache. So it uses the cache plugin, the forward plugin, and a few other plugins from core DNS. So all the metrics that core DNS plugins export are available. And the best part is they're available on a per node basis. So you can get uh, insight into what your DNS request patterns look like on a per node basis. And maybe you can pinpoint that to certain pods on your node as well. So you get that extra granular uh, insight. Here are just some of the stats I put out there. This is just the tip of the iceberg. There are several more. In the cache plugin, you see cache hits, misses. In the forward plugin, which sends the request to the upstream, you can see what the request count is, what the latency distribution looks like. Uh, you can also see this on a per zone basis. So you get separate stats for your cluster domain. You get separate stats for external queries which is nice to see, the distribution of latency particularly. OK, hopefully this all sounds good in theory, but does it actually work? And to cover that, I would like to uh, invite Blake to talk more. So at Postmates, we uh, have been running Kubernetes for a little over two and a half years. Um, and we've hit all of the problems that were listed around DNS. Um, we initially tried to mitigate this problem by deploying kubedns as a daemon set. Um, it works fine. It does require modifying kubelet args to point the local node at, its, uh, at the resolver. But um, the problem with it is if you're running just kubedns as a daemon set, all of those daemon set pods are watching all pods via the API server. And over time, it uh, becomes pretty resource intensive. Um, so we wanted a, a little more streamlined um, solution to this, and we were very excited when we found out about the development for this project, so we started testing it right away. Um, just some stress testing scenarios that we did. We, uh, most of them target a single cluster domain service, the Kubernetes default service, so that we eliminate uh, any uh, you know, additional variables in the system. Uh, it uses confirmed DNS, uh, which is uh, written by Justin Santa Barbara. Um, the, if you don't know him, he's uh, in SIG ABOS and does um, COPS. Is the, he's the main maintainer on COPS. He, um, he was nice enough to provide us this code, and we did a whole bunch of different scenarios testing this. Um, so his, each of the confirmed DNS pods send about 200 queries per second. Um, 100 of A records, 100 of quad A records. And so uh, most of our tests deployed about 240 pods on fairly small clusters uh, just to get a controlled environment to stress these out. We did this on various providers, and uh, it was all pretty similar on all of them. 
So this shows how easy it is to trigger the contract overflow, especially on smaller node types, uh, like a default DKA instance type or something, uh, any, anything on uh, any managed provider. Usually they're quite small to begin with. Um, and the difference with node local is pretty dramatic. You can see all of these are five second timeouts. I'm filtering for anything above 100 milliseconds. And there are a lot of uh, five second timeouts. Uh, this is the same cluster with node local cache deployed. You can see there's a few minor outliers, but uh, by far most, most queries are uh, under five milliseconds. This is a similar test. Uh, this one used a range of DNS names that triggered search path, sorry, search path expansion and a bunch of external queries. Um, this results in hitting the contract limit very quickly because of the explosion of queries from all those uh, different types. And um, you can see on the right side there, after we deployed node local DNS, it uh, really improved latency. This is a similar test, just a different view of the distribution of um, latency. And you can see none, there are no queries over 60 milliseconds, and 60 milliseconds is an extreme outlier. Um, it's also important to note that on much larger nodes, you probably won't hit contract, but we do still see a lot of five-second timeouts from either net, fil net filter race conditions, UDP packet loss. Uh, there's uh, a range of possible problems here. And we sidestep almost all of them using this. So uh, we deployed Node Local Cache. It was great. We um, solved almost all of the problems with cluster queries. Um, we did notice, however, that external queries were a little bit erratic, uh, a ton of cache misses because the queries were not happen happening uh, quickly enough or um, just a, a range of external queries, so it, they weren't getting a lot of cache hits. We made use of the, pre, the prefetch plugin for Core DNS, which is quite effective at uh, reducing the overall latency there. You can see the dramatic change once we enabled that option. Um, and if you have questions about that, I can answer that after. Uh, this shows our production, query, our production cluster. Um, we have around 50,000 queries per second at peak. Um, and the nodes are really large. They're, um, um, I believe, 64 core instances. And uh, we have some very large workloads running on them with extremely high throughput. Um, the core DNS is the cluster DNS service. And you can see that all of the latency there is sub millisecond, which is really a uh, huge improvement <laughs> over our previous setup. And you can only see the top four nodes there, but um, there's, uh, I believe, around 120 nodes in that cluster, uh, all very large nodes. And I'll hand it back to Pavitra. OK. Thank you so much, Blake. Uh, I want to point out that Blake was one of the first users of our feature, and uh, he's, he's given great feedback uh, from the time we released it, and I'm so glad we, we could present it at a wider audience today. Uh, so yeah, hopefully now you're excited or interested in trying this feature out in your clusters. So how can you run it? Uh, so here are some of the steps you can follow to run it. If you are using the E2E scripts to bring up your cluster, uh, you can use the command up there in the first uh, uh, option there. Uh, it works for 1.13 and above clusters. You can run it that way. But on any environment, on any cluster, you can use the YAML in the links here to do just a kubectl apply. Uh, the lower link is the newer YAML, uh, and you can, you can try either one. Um, but uh, you would need to do the cluster DNS change. It's a flag to kubelet, which you will need to modify uh, so that pods automatically start using uh, node local cache. But if you want to keep the current uh, setup and cannot change cluster DNS flag for any reason, you can still use it on an existing cluster. And Justin Santa Barbara again wrote some scripts that you can use to make this happen. So do check out the uh, link in the pull request there 
or you can reach out to us if you have more questions on how to run this. But these are some of the ways you can try out the feature, and it would be great if you can provide your feedback after you try it too. So now the only section we have is what's coming in the future. We released the feature in alpha in 1.13, so we are graduating it to beta in uh, 1.15. Uh, and yeah, we did, like I mentioned, we got great feedback from some of our users, so it would be great to get more. And uh, the two items that we are working on, or uh, proposals are in progress, are HA and Autopath. So the one question that I got uh, after folks tried out the feature is like, hey, what about high availability for my DNS? Uh, now, node local DNS introduces a single point of failure. What if it's down? What do I do? Uh, so I do want to start by saying that this is a common problem for any node-specific agent. Like take kubelet, take kubeproxy. It's one per node with the same HA or non-HA story. So to some extent, you, you, you consider your node as your failure domain, so anything fails, it's contained within that domain, within that node. However, I understand there can be scenarios where DNS downtime cannot be tolerated, and for those, we have a few options. One of them is to run two daemon sets instead of one and use the same IP address, so whichever one is up can answer queries. We have another option that I would go into some detail about, and this is what this will let you keep the existing single daemon set approach, but we can do some IP tables tricks to uh, provide HA. So let's take a quick look on how this works. I have the link to the cap here, which has the full detail. I'm gonna go through it a little bit fast. Um, so the picture is still similar to what we had seen before. You still have the node, you have the per node cache. But if you notice, it listens on the link local IP, it listens on an additional service IP. And not just any service IP, but it's the kube DNS service IP. So what this lets you do is the client pods can talk to node local cache without changing anything on their side. So they don't have to change their cluster DNS, it's already pointing to the dot 10. So they hit the cluster, D uh, they hit the node local. And we will install custom IP tables rules so that if node local DNS is up and running, queries will go to no node local. If it is not, then those custom rules will be removed, which will result in the normal behavior, which is the service IP and then going to the kube DNS pods behind. So how do we decide? So the only other thing is, then what happens when node local needs to talk to kube DNS on a cache miss? What IP does it use? So we create a second service with the same selectors as kubedns service, so it is backed by the same kubedns pods. This, is, this new service IP is what node local will talk to when it needs to fetch entries for a cache miss. So the one question here, who decides when to add the custom rules to route to node local, when to remove them, and send it to kubedns? That part is a little bit of a TBD. But you can put this logic in the same pod as a sidecar container, or you can put it in any other daemon set that is running host networking that's already doing a bunch of IP tables manipulation, maybe. Uh, but that would essentially have to ping the link local IP to see if node local is alive. And if it is, keep the rules. If it is not, remove the rules so the packets go to the kubedns service, which is the natural fallback we want anyway. One caveat is that this approach wouldn't work for IPVS mode of kube proxy uh, because of the way kube, uh, the IPVS code, it creates its own interface and binds the IP, so we cannot reuse that trick here. But this is certainly an option you can look into if HA is a concern. And I have the link there for the more details uh, uh, the, that's captured in the cap. The one other feature we are working on is Autopath. And I want to take a few minutes to talk about this. Uh, we, we discussed uh, what Autopath is. It is the idea of moving the search path expansion logic from the client to the server. So why we need Autopath, or why we need these search paths is because you want to be able to discover other services using their short name. Say you created a my new service in the default namespace. You would like to resolve it by just saying my new service instead of my new service dot default dot service dot cluster dot local. 
you want to use the short names or you want to use name dot namespace to find these service IP addresses. So that's what the search paths let you do. So if you remove it, you're losing that ability. So with Autopath, you get to keep that ability, but you get to reduce the number of parallel queries on the client side as well. So yeah, I went through most of the benefits here. Uh, the other uh, benefits of this proposal are that you can extend it to any domain that has uh, search paths, even outside of Kubernetes. Uh, it can be applied anywhere. And also, I want to point out that CoreDNS Autopath plugin already supports this today, but the proposal we are, pro we are uh, putting forth is uh, less resource intensive. And the details you can find there, but I will go through quickly what the new workflow will look like. With this, let's say we introduce a new mode, and all these names are TBD. It's in progress. So, but we will introduce a new mode, say cluster first with Autopath. And in this mode, Kubelet will create a single custom search path. Instead of the five or four, whatever search paths it creates, it will be just a single one. And that will have the namespace and the suffix encoded in it. Because depending on the pod you're running on, your search path is going to be different. So this is the search path that will be in the podsresolve.conf. Now, what happens when the pod looks up an IP or looks up a domain name? Let us take a look. Now, when a client pod looks up a host name, say foo.com, the search path expansion kicks in, and that's the domain that is going to be sent to node local. Node local cache will have the ability to recognize this custom pattern and extract namespace and cluster suffix from it. And once it has both these variables, it knows to construct what the new list of search paths need to be. And once it constructs this, it can put it as an eDNS0 option. It's an extended DNS value in the, in the request packet. It's a key value, so we are going to introduce a new option number, and we're going to put the list of search paths as the value. And if the cluster DNS knows to recognize this key value option, it can look at the search paths and fan out into multiple queries. So that's, that's what the last uh, green box is doing there. It gets the cluster, uh, uh, all of the search paths from the node local in the packet, just needs to look at it, append all of them, send out the queries, return anything that had a non-empty answer. So that is how this would work, and you don't need to watch any resources in order to figure out what your search paths need to be and you've moved the search path logic outside of uh, the client. So this is one other thing that's in progress. Like I said, feel free to comment on the cap. Uh, feedback would be great. Uh, I believe this is the end of what we had here. So I hope uh, this was useful and got you excited to try it out on your cluster. And I have the test that we talked about. I have it running on my cluster. If, and if you want to take a look after, I'll be around uh, for questions. We'll, we'll both be around for questions, but I have the setup also if you want to take a look. Now we have uh, time for some questions. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, my, my question is regarding the TTLs for the DNS cache. Mm -hmm. And uh, if that is quite long, then we could get, there's a risk that the application could get like an old version for the DNS. And that would impact some timeouts on the request. So what, what do you think, how do you think we could go around that? Are you talking about timeouts for um, NX domain answers? Or yeah, just... for example, your application should, like, would, would, would call the local DNS cache mm -hmm. and it would get like an old version for another app. Right. Then if it tries to reach it, it's, it's, it's not there after, for example, a Kubernetes new deployment or something. OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, so we do set the timeout to a low value for, um, for the negative domains, so that if it's a case that it, it, a client looked it up and we cached it as no, no host available, but the entry actually came up, you don't want to run into the case where that's not reflected. So for negative answers, we do set that value to a low number. But I'm not sure if that's answering the question. Yeah, kind of. You just said that we set it like to a low number. Yeah, we set it to number. a low number yeah. for a scenario which might be similar to what you yeah. described. That, that is part of the YAML. We set it to a low value. Hello. Hey. 
first, thank you very much. I still keep really bad memories of those long weeks trying to debug DNS <laughs> latency in my clusters, and, mm -hmm. and it's really nice to see a technical implementation of a solution for that. So thank you. Yeah. Um, the second thing is a question. Um, we, we do have a lot of latency-sensitive applications in our clusters, and one of the challenge we see is also the, I think you have an, I think you have an answer for this, but um, one of the challenge we see is that DNS resolution for most HTTP libraries is on the critical path. Um, and the TTLs for Kubernetes services is five seconds. So every five seconds, you need to actually make the full DNS. The cache will expire. It will be a cache miss. And you need to do the DNS resolution. And this takes some time. And you do this every five seconds for an IP that barely changes. Is there a way to do some prefetching behind the scene? or something like this. You mentioned prefetch before, so I'm really hoping that's the solution. Um, so yeah, that's my question. OK. Do you want to talk about the prefetch? Uh, so yeah, the prefetching will work for any of the, you can set it up for clustered domains also. Um, but by default, it is, at least the way I showed it, we set it up only for external queries, because that's where it matters, matters the most for us. But you could configure it any way you'd like with uh, you, you can tweak the settings. We have it set quite liberally so that we always get the most popular queries prefetched. Um, you can have it a little less aggressive and, and have it so that um, your applications have kind of a, a specific configuration. Um, there's also the, the cache settings in Core DNS are quite flexible. You can set different cache for different subdomains if you wanted to break it out that way. Um, and then you could also have um, different default cache timeouts for, for those different subdomains. Hello, and thank you again for the very nice talk about this subject. Uh, my question is about Autopath. Uh, current implementation always uh, requires that you have pod verification enabled. It sounds like your new approach may not have to do with that anymore because, and it is related with the footprint of core DNS in the system. So can you maybe tell us a bit more about it? How basically will it need to be enabled from now on? Mm. Yeah, I, I'm not, I'll ask the question again because I'm not sure I got it. I'll, I'll ask, you can tell me if I got it uh, right. Um, are you asking how the new autopath compares to what the existing one in core DNS is? Yes, especially regarding footprint of core DNS pods, meaning that the verification, the pod verified uh, setting is always memory. Uh, you no, know, it's hogging memory, and mm -hmm. seems that now there can be a way out of it because of how you implement uh, the autopath into the node local. Right. So the autopath, as it works today in core DNS, it. Yes, there needs to be a watch that's happening in order to map the pod's IP to the pod's namespace. So it has to watch the pod resource in order to do this. But with the current approach, we don't need to do that because we've pushed it to the uh, client to encode this information and send it out. So again, I think it's hard to pinpoint how much of the memory usage is through Autopath unless you've had some benchmarking. But that diff that you might be seeing shouldn't be there with this other approach because the only thing would be that it'll still fan out into multiple queries and collect the answers. But there shouldn't be something that's growing as there are more endpoints in your service, for instance. Yeah, thank you. Hello. Regarding the contract issue in the kernel, is there any issue that this be solved at point, some point in the future, or is it just too hard to fix? Running into the limit, like too many entries the, limit? The, um, uh, there is a race condition in the kernel. Is there any hope that this can be fixed? The link to the blog, and uh, yeah, I, I don't know as much as the authors of the blog, but they did submit uh, three patches, I believe, to, to the kernel, and two of them have been accepted in different kernel versions. So fixes are definitely underway for that. And I did talk to them at the Vive booth yesterday. So fixes are definitely underway for that. All right. OK. Thank you thank so you. much. And enjoy the party, everyone. Thanks a lot. Good job. Good job.